All right. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to bring someone to the show that I have a tremendous amount of not only professional respect for, but personal respect as well. He's a good buddy of mine and a favorite of the channel. Jason Hartman, real estate expert extraordinaire. Welcome back, buddy. Hey, George. Great to be here. Uh, thanks for having me back. You know, last time or one of the previous episodes where we had you on, we got into this concept called refi till you die. I think that's a, a term that you coined. Yes. So I think this is extremely important and it's something that the average person can leverage for no pun intended to <laughs> maybe take some money out and as, as a way to defer taxes or to use as another investment property. But a lot of people don't understand this concept and it's something that you've got down to a science. So I'd yeah. love to explore that on this episode of The Rebel Capitalist. Absolutely, George. So uh, as on, on previous episodes of the show, uh, we discussed uh, how to use inflation to uh, create wealth. This is literally the hidden wealth creator with real estate investments. Most investors, as we all know, will say that uh, real estate's a great hedge against inflation, but it's dramatically more than that through the technique I taught on one of the prior videos I did with you called inflation induced debt destruction. Mm -hmm. And then we also discussed on the show, the Hartman risk evaluator. We discussed the LTI ratio, not the LTV ratio that commonly people know, which is the right. la uh, loan to value <laughs> ratio. This is the land to improvement ratio. And we discussed that. And, um, one of the things that uh, is sort of a theme of all my teachings uh, on the podcast over the last 15 years and, uh, and to my audiences at our live conferences, George, is the idea of leverage and how incredibly powerful leverage is for us as real estate investors. That will not come as a big surprise to most people listening, but there's much more to leverage than the, the typical person thinks. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, it's great because, and I'll just use these as round numbers because they're simple. Okay. Uh, if you put 10% uh, down on a property and you have 10% appreciation, your gross return on investment, not the net of course, because there are costs and so forth, but just to roughly make the understanding possible, you basically got a 100% return, $1 million worth of real estate, you put a hundred thousand down, um, goes up to 1.1 million. You got a hundred thousand back on your hundred thousand dollar investment. That's a hundred percent return, right? And that's yeah. wonderful. But it it it's of course more complicated than that. That's just to illustrate the point. Now, um, a lot of people say, well, you know, Jason, look, if you use a lot of leverage. I see the benefits with the leverage, and if I keep levering my property up, and I use the strategy you talk about called equity stripping, which is the idea that over the years, as your properties uh, gain equity through either appreciation or mortgage pay down, and remember, the, the wonderful thing about the debt we use is that it's self-liquidating debt. We don't pay our own debts with income property. Our tenants pay our debts right. for us. We effectively outsource the debt payment obligation to the tenant. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But if we keep pulling equity out of our properties as the mortgages are paid down and the properties appreciate over time, how do we ever get rich, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the question. Where, where, do, where's our payoff? Well, okay, we sell the property someday and we take a capital gain, right? So what I want to talk to you about today, and I think your audience will really benefit from George, is the idea of, as you said, what I call refi till you die. What we're looking for here is we're looking for the most tax efficient way to extract the wealth from our real estate portfolio. Not only that, we also want to look for the best asset protection strategy. Now, asset protection is a giant subject. Uh, of course, the first step is good insurance. Uh, then you could talk about entity formation, have LLCs or corporations or a trust or, you know, there's a whole bunch of complicated stuff. I've interviewed many attorneys on my podcast over the years discussing those things, and they're all fine. But as I always say, the best asset protection is a high loan balance. 
Okay, counterintuitive. The best asset protection and the best insurance on your property is a high loan balance. Why is that? Well, think of any natural disaster. Think of Hurricane Katrina, which was this giant natural disaster that affected many, many property owners in the U.S. The people, George, that had a lot of equity in their property got burned the most. The people that had very little equity in their properties made out the best. And I'll tell you why. Attorneys general for six states in the affected areas made a deal with the big mortgage companies to put a moratorium on mortgage payments. And FEMA came in, offered all sorts of aid and help. And many people just walked away from their properties and said, you know, this is too much. I can't handle it. Here, bank, you can have it back. Okay. And, you know, essentially, that's the deal you make with a lender. You say, look, I'll either pay the payments or I'll give you back the collateral. That's the deal. That's what the deal is when you enter into that. And the lenders like that deal because real estate is a historically proven asset class. And they usually make out okay. They usually get the collateral back and they make out okay or they get the payments, one yeah. or the other, and the loan is ultimately paid off. Yeah, During you know, the it, yeah. it, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It just reminds me of that saying that if you owe the bank a million dollars, you got a you got a problem. If you owe a right. hundred million, they got a problem. Right, right, absolutely right. That was a J. Paul Getty saying. He was the world's first billionaire, and J. Paul Getty said that. You know, he said if you owe, if you owe the bank a hundred dollars, that's your problem. If you owe the bank a hundred million dollars, that's the bank's problem. Okay, mm -hmm. and and what we find is that the actual behavior in this kind of situation during the Great Recession, just over ten years ago, for example, is that. The lender becomes your partner when you have challenges. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a loan or if you have a low loan balance, the lender then becomes your predator. They become your enemy. And think about it from their perspective. Look, I'm a lender, okay? I lend money on real estate deals all the time. I, I have a couple of companies that finance real estate deals. That's what we do. I have a company that uh, brokers real estate deals and uh, a media company. That's what you see on the screen now, my podcast network. Um, and, and so uh, th that behavior, basically you want to make the lender your partner so that if you run into problems, your partner is there to help you. OK, and you also have a much better tax strategy, a much better insurance policy, if you will, a form of insurance uh, with this plan. So uh, uh, here is the basic idea. And I'll just go to the slides here. This is this is the example I want to share. Now, I, I want to say to your listeners, this is definitely more complicated than what I'm showing. It's right. not too complicated, but I've simplified things for the purpose of example. I've rounded off numbers. I've simplified things. And what you'll find is that it's probably much better than the example I'm about to share. Okay. But just for purposes of speed and efficiency, you got to round off the numbers to show yeah. the concept. Okay. Uh, so here's the idea. Let's say that uh, someone is watching this video today or listening to your podcast and they're hearing this and they're not seeing the illustrations. Uh, of course, you can see those on the YouTube channel. Um, what we're suggesting is that that investor might buy $1 million worth of property. Okay, $1 million worth. And in our world, that would be 10, 10, $100,000 homes, inexpensive properties, okay? Because we like those bread and butter properties in those nice, conservative, boring, linear markets with a great yield, with great cash flow. And uh, so you'd be diversified because ideally you'd, you'd spread those 10 properties among three markets. Mm -hmm. So you'd have some geographical diversification, uh, the old saying in real estate is all real estate is local. All real estate is local. And to buy those 10 properties, assuming you can qualify for the financing and such, you would put $200,000 down or 20% down. Right. You would have closing costs depending on uh, the type of borrower you are, you are, the type of loan program you choose, of maybe somewhere around 3.5% approximately. So you need $235,000 to acquire the portfolio in that example. And then 
we say you should have at least 4% in reserves, money in the bank for contingencies, for problems, for vacancies, for unexpected repairs. You never want to be forced to sell a property because you weren't prepared, okay? Yeah. Uh, so 4,000 or 4% which is $40,000 in reserves. So the total is $275,000. And the beauty of income property, of course, is that the bank pays for 80% in this example of your investment. In Try that in the stock market or a mutual fund or with gold or silver or platinum or palladium or Bitcoin or anything else, right? You don't have the great debt opportunity. Uh, income property, is the most debt-friendly asset class in America. It's the most tax-favored asset class in America, and it's the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. So $275,000 to buy the $1 million portfolio. Okay, let's move on. Now, uh, the good old Jerry Maguire, Tom Cruise, uh, from, from the movie, what was his famous saying? It was, show me the money. Show me the money, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Show me the money. Now, if you keep your properties leveraged up, you're not going to have great cash flow because they're levered and you don't have much equity in them. And I want you to keep it that way. I think that's the best way to do it. And I'll tell you why. Okay. So let's get into some examples here. Now, this is refi till you die. I'm going to guide you right through it. Okay. So this chart basically shows the $1 million portfolio value, right? Okay. To acquire that portfolio, we needed 235000 plus reserves of 40000 extra just in the bank on the sidelines, ready for any problems or contingencies. When we buy this portfolio, we have $800,000 in loans, and that means we have $200,000 in equity. That's our down payment was $200,000, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody understands that's how the journey begins, okay? Now, I'm sure anybody who listen, listening who's, you know, over 35, 30, 35, 40 years old understands that time passes a lot faster than we all think, doesn't it? It goes really quickly. And, and so the example here I give is I'm using what's called the rule of 72, okay? And the rule of 72 basically shows you when a number doubles in value, okay? okay. Yeah, yeah. And so here I'm using a 12-year cycle based on a 6% appreciation rate. Now, the appreciation rate is debatable. You can slice and dice it every which way. Uh, you know, you can slice and dice it by location, by property price range, property type, newer properties, older properties. There's just a million ways to argue about that. But generally speaking, any expert you'll talk to will, will tell you that real estate in the United States of America will appreciate somewhere in the neighborhood of 6% annually on a nationwide basis, okay? Uh, uh, is that a, a nominal number or a real number? A nominal number, good question. Great, see, folks, you have a very sophisticated host here who's not gonna let uh, any funny numbers go by, okay? <laughs> there's, there's no fuzzy math here. That is nominal <laughs> appreciation, meaning that, of course, it, it's not real dollars, right? Because real dollars are the purchasing power of those dollars. Nominal dollars are just the name of those dollars, okay? So we're only talking about non nominal dollars. You're absolutely right. Um, but interestingly, there is a little bit of a, actually kind of a significant um, caveat to that. As the property appreciates, it's appreciating in real dollars each time. Okay. One of the ways that, and I'll just start from scratch here, and you can tell me if this is the direction you were going, and I think it'll help the audience, and it'll also go back to what you're saying on how a real estate investor can make money on inflation. Right. Using your previous example, if you put 10000 down on a $100,000 property, and the value of that property goes to 110000 well, you made a 100% return. Mm -hmm. Because you have a, a ten thousand of additional equity for your ten thousand dollar cost basis, right? Mm -hmm. What most people don't realize is, if that property were to go up with the rate of inflation, 
So it didn't increase in real terms. It only increased in nominal terms. Although your house doesn't buy any more goods or services, whether it's priced at 100,000 or 110,000, you actually gain purchasing power because the rate of inflation in that situation was 10%, but your money increased by 100%. So although the house only went up with the rate of inflation, your purchasing power still increased substantially. Above inflation. See, that, George, what you're describing is what I call the double inflation arbitrage. That's exactly what you're describing, and it's a beautiful thing. Okay, so there's our example. That's our starting point. We got this $1 million portfolio. Now, we let 12 years go by. The reason we picked 12 years is because based on that 6% appreciation rate, in 12 years, the portfolio value will double. It'll, it'll jump by double, okay? So now, 12 years later, so let's take an example. Say you're listening to this and you're 40 years young, and, and 40 ain't what it used to be. That's pretty young by today's standards. If you're taking care of yourself, I mean, it's a whole new world. 40 is the new 25, okay? So, <laughs> you know, it really is, you know? I mean, there are incredible advances around the corner in the world of longevity, and biohacking. I, I have a show by that name, the Longevity and Biohacking Podcast. Um, and I know you know that. And I explore some of these issues and how they affect the economy and society because we got this aging population. And man, that's going to affect inflation significantly. It's a whole nother show we should do on that. It's interesting. Okay. But, but also pertaining to this, that Social Security might not be there if people are living to be 100 years old because the Social yeah. Security, it, it's all, it, well, it's not there anyway. But even if it was there, it's only meant to last until yeah. the average life expectancy, which, of course, when uh, when uh, Social Security started, yeah. Yeah. They, they set the age in which you'd start to collect after the average life expectancy or after the time where you're expected to die. So they said, oh, yeah, you'll collect Social Security at 61, but the Maybe. average life expectancy at that yeah, time was yeah. 60. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it, it, that, that was a good idea back then. Now they're going broke trying to keep the promise. So they'll keep the promise probably in nominal dollars, but in real dollars, that'll be worthless almost. Yeah. OK, so so that's the reality. OK, so you start out, you're 40 years old. OK, then 12 years go by, you're 52 years young. OK, 52 years young and your your portfolio has now gone to two million dollars. So now we look on the on the chart. You've gained one million dollars in in gain through that appreciation. And we're not counting positive cash flow, tax benefits, uh, mortgage pay down. This is a super simplified example that is, it's better in real life, okay? It should be better in real life. So um, $2 million portfolio, you go to the bank and you say, hey, I want to refinance my portfolio now, and I want to get an 80% loan-to-value ratio. So the bank says, okay, uh, we will loan you $1.6 million, and we're going to pay off your $800,000 in loans Okay, and give you a new loan for 1.6 million, 80% of $2 million portfolio. Now your equity position has doubled. You now have $400,000 in equity, but you have $800,000 in cash. Cash. Okay, now that cash, let's assume that you're not listening to George's show and you're really unaware and you stick that cash in your mattress and you earn zero return on it, okay, which you would never do. But let's just, for purposes of our super simple example, let's do that. Or maybe you live on the cash, right? And you want your portfolio to work with you or to work for you. So say you just take the $800,000 and divide it by 12 years till the next refi till you die cycle. You have now tax-free income because there's no tax on borrowed money of $67,000 a year, just rounding off slightly, okay? So to, to be clear, guys, because I think a lot of people right here, Jason, would be saying, well, yeah, but Jason, my loan amount has gone up so much. My mortgage payment will point. also go up, but they're forgetting that the renters yeah. are paying the mortgage. So they would get that $800,000 without having to take any more money 
per month out of their own pocket. I mean, in 12 years, are rents going to be higher or lower than they are now? Obviously, they're going to be higher. They're always higher. I mean, that that has been proven historically. There's never really been an exception. Over well, the long term, rents go up. No question. Yeah, even if right? you look at the great financial crisis, rents went up there as well. Yeah, yeah, because people were pushed out of the housing market. They were pushed out of the ownership market and into the renter market, into the renter pool. So that actually ultimately strengthened rents. There was a little time there when they softened a bit, but that was only because they weren't foreclosing on the houses and there was no price discovery. Okay, but as soon as the politicians got out of the way, it all started working when the free market could do its thing. So now we've got our $67,000 a year in passive income which is earning zero return. We're just sticking our $800,000 in a shoebox, and we're pulling out one twelfth of it every year. And now we go to the next cycle. By the way, the timing could be anything. Of course, you're not gonna do it exactly at every 12 years. This is just an example to show you how it would work as the portfolio doubles in each cycle based on the rule of 72s. Um, and you've also had some positive cash flow. I mean, look, when you buy this portfolio today, uh, the, if, if anybody goes to jasonhartman.com, they click on the properties page and they look at the property performance that my company offers, they will see that a typical property will usually generate about $200 per month positive cash flow if it's fully leveraged, okay? So in this example today, those 10 properties would probably generate around $2,000 a month in positive cash flow. We're not even including that. That's why this example is so much, it's so much better than the example in real life, hopefully. Yeah, and, I mean, and, listen, yeah. things go wrong. I don't want to say that there's, this is not without its challenges. Occasionally you're gonna have to evict a tenant. You're gonna have to do a repair we all are mature enough to know that, you know, nothing is perfect. Okay. Yeah. But looking at the 800,000 that you extracted, wouldn't that be a little bit more because within that 12 years time, the tenants have paid down your principal amount. Yes, absolutely. So there would be more yeah. equity there available to pull out from the, from the absolutely. loan from the bank, yeah. the refi. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, of course there would. This is a super simplified example. Okay. So okay. yes, you would have positive cash flow, equity, tax benefits. You'd have all kinds of benefits, inflation induced debt destruction, like we talked about on the on the prior episode with you. So we have it's all that. amazing. And you're only putting in two hundred grand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, two thirty five and, and forty thousand oh. in reserves. So yeah, we closing costs. You know, you got closing right. costs in there. Right. Okay. So now let's wait another twelve short years, which go back by in the blink of an eye. Of course, we all know that by now, right? Now, 12 years go by again. Our portfolio has gone from $2 million to $4 million. Hmm. $4 million. Mm -hmm. Our gain is now $3 million. We're only 64 years young. We're, we're a spring chicken by, in, <laughs> by, by, by the new standards that are happening. I mean, look, it's not that far away that I'll be 64. And I feel great, you know, like I'm young and I mean, I, it's not that close either. Okay. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, like I'm actually starting to think of, you know, maybe I should retire. I mean, I could have retired when I was, you know, uh, 2005, I could have retired. Okay. Yeah. But I, I love, I love doing this. I love helping investors. So it's just, uh, it's just fun. But um, 64 will be the new 45. Okay. For example. Right. Um, and, and so, now we've got a $4 million portfolio. We've got a $3 million in gain. We go to the bank and we say, look, I want to refinance again. I want an 80% loan to value refinance. The bank says, okay, we'll loan you $3.2 million. That's 80% of 4 million. Mm -hmm. So now your equity has doubled again. You've got 800,000 in equity and you've got cash out in your pocket of $1.6 million. Okay. Now, if you stick that in a shoebox and you earn zero return on it, which means you're clearly not listening to George's show. Okay. But say you just take one twelfth of that 1.6 million out every year, you will have 133,000 tax free dollars every single year. Now, remember, based on current tax rates, depending on where you live, 
that $133,000 is probably equivalent to about $200,000 somewhere in that neighborhood if you pay taxes on it. But remember, there's no tax on borrowed money. No tax on borrowed money. Now let's look at this, George. As an aside, I want you to consider the old-fashioned way of doing this. The old-fashioned idea is, you know, buy some rental properties, let the tenants pay off the loans, uh, you know, let the rents go up, get some tax benefits, and pay them off. Beautiful, okay? Let your equity increase. Well, when your equity increases, your positive cash flow is going to increase. And guess what? That's taxable. You have to pay tax on positive cash flow, okay? Right. And, and of course, you have other tax benefits, but they're going to offset each other, okay? So you're going to increase your tax liability by having positive cash flow. The better way to do it is to borrow out of your properties, and there's no tax on borrowed money, okay? Right. So then you just in, reinvest that money, you earn a return on it. Ideally, you buy more properties or and you that's invest what I was in save. Yeah, yeah. for sure. This is, this is why, look, income property has what we call self liquidating debt. Okay. But it always, it also has, if you keep buying more properties, a self perpetuating uh, asset creation machine. Look, years ago in history, there was a time when everybody was fascinated with the idea and they thought they could invent something called, and you know what I'm going to say, their perpetual motion machine. Mm. Okay. Everybody thought for a while that they could, you know, outdo the laws of physics and entropy, right? And, and create a perpetual motion machine where once they kicked this flywheel into gear, it would just go forever and, and generate energy or run locomotives or whatever they wanted to do or you know, run a turbine forever, right? And and no one ever invented the perpetual motion machine. But I would argue that this is it, okay? Because <laughs> because you can you can buy more properties, uh, or you can invest in you know whatever George is telling you to invest in twelve years from now, uh, that is the hot investment of the day. Or you can just live off the borrowed money. Okay, let's go one more cycle just for fun. Twelve more years, okay? Now your portfolio has doubled again to $8 million. You've got an $8 million portfolio. Beautiful. You've got $7 million in gain. You go to the bank, say, I'd like to refinance for 80% loan to value. The bank says, okay, we will now loan you $6.4 million. We're going to pay off the much less than $3.2 million you, own by then, you owe by then because it will have been paid down by the tenant. But for simplicity, let's assume you paid nothing off. You just have the same loan balance. Now uh, you have $1.6 million in equity. So your equity position has doubled again. And you have $3.2 million in cold, hard cash. Okay. And if you divide that by 12, you have now one quarter of a million dollars, 1250000 or sorry, $250,000 every year to live on if you get 0% return on your money, okay, and you don't invest it, and you stick it under your mattress, and it's tax-free, which probably would be equivalent to somewhere in the neighborhood of $350,000 taxable. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, and, and the, I think the pushback there would be that, well, Jason, I don't know that it's going to be 6% appreciation per annum because the housing yeah, markets in a bubble and all these things but but i think the counterbalance to that is that you are not including any type of return on the money that you extracted it's it's like you're just using it as an annuity to go out there and spend where if you took that 66,000 a year 133,000 a year yep. and just bought more rental properties oh, with it yeah. if you did the math on that i'll bet you you'd make even more in in the long run, then if, if you just calculate uh, a three percent annual inflation, or may, maybe even a you know one or two percent, maybe flat. I don't know. George, I'm really glad you brought that up. And you know what? We should do an episode sometime on how to analyze a real estate deal, how to read a pro forma, what numbers should be on a pro forma, and how to really analyze it. I've got a free video on that on my website at jasonhartman.com, which can help people. It's just a free 27-minute video, and it's it's 
very informal. I'm just going through a performa and I am showing people how to read the numbers, how to analyze the deal, how to know, you know, so many investors in any type of asset class, um, but, but real estate for sure too. You know, a lot of them think they're losing when they're actually winning because they simply don't know how to do the math and mm -hmm. math, you know, math is infallible. It, it's it's reality, okay? And uh, you got to know how to do the math. But if you go to jasonhartman.com and click on the properties page, as George, you've done, you will see yeah. properties that generate a return on investment uh, in excess of 20% annually because income property is a multidimensional asset class. That's why you can actually get those types of returns because you're getting them from many different areas, many different streams of ROI or return on investment. Okay. That's why you get them. Um, but if you want to just look at it in a one dimensional way, you could simply look at what we call one of the metrics on the performance, which is cash on cash return. Now it's not as good as it used to be. I mean, look, coming out of the great recession 10 years ago, we used to have properties with cash on cash returns of 13, 15, 18, 19% annually, cash on cash, yeah. meaning that if the property doesn't appreciate, even if it depreciates, uh, if, you know, if nothing good happens except you maintain the same income to expense ratio, that's the cash on cash return, right? Now, you know, properties, the deals aren't as good as they used to be. There's no question about it. You know, I love when you get these, you know, hokey guru, uh, sleazy operators up there that say, well, there's never been a better time to buy real estate. Well, of course there's been a better time. 1972 <laughs> was a much better time. Okay. You know, so, you know, I can't stand when I hear that. I just know I walk out the door when I'm at those conferences and think, oh, this guy's a, he's a scam artist. Uh, anyway, um, but, you know, if you get a 10% cash on cash return, okay, just for round numbers sake, this initial portfolio, in addition to everything we've shown you here, would be generating $100,000 a year in, in, cash, cash. in cash on cash. Well, not exactly positive cash flow, but well, yeah, essentially in cash on cash return. And what that means is it's the amount of money you put into the deal versus the amount of money you're getting back on the deal in that one year. That's the 10%. So here, over the course of 12 years, you'd get $120,000 in cash on cash return, plus what you're seeing here. Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? You that That's why yeah. income property is the most historically proven asset class in the world, yeah. because it's multi-dimensional. Yeah. Multi-dimensional. Yeah. And this is exactly why I always suggest that people compartmentalize their portfolio and into investments, speculation, and insurance, but to use the definition of investments that I use, and that's that if you're buying an asset as an investment, it has to pay you yes. to own it. If Good. it doesn't pay you to own it, it's not an investment, it's a speculation. And me personally, I can't tell anyone what to do with their own money, but for me personally, I keep, well, now it's, e it's even more than that, but usually it's about 80% of my portfolio in an asset that pays me to own it. Of course, that's, that's, that's real estate. Yeah. George, that is a great definition. Um, what I say is the investment uh, uh, or the, the definition of an investment, which is similar to yours expressed in another way. You, you'll know if something's an investment, if it produces income. If it does not produce income, it is not an investment. It is only a speculation. It right. is only gambling. Okay. Um, and, and granted, listen, you can win speculating and gambling sometimes, okay? I mean, you might buy cryptocurrency or, uh, you know, a property in some cyclical market that doesn't make any sense from day one that you just get lucky and it appreciates like crazy and, and you make a bunch of money. Good for you. But look, at, as we age, we realize, look, I don't want to have to earn my money again. It's pretty hard to earn it, okay, from the day job. So I want an investment that is conservative, 
and prudent, and I'm going to be a yield-oriented investor. I'm going to be a cash flow investor. Uh, you know, in the stock market, they'd call that a dividend investor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the more conservative way to invest. And um, because income property has these multi-dimensional characteristics, you know, I, I I can be a conservative investor, and at the same time. I might get lucky and have a bunch of appreciation too, but don't count on it. It's not, it's not the game. Okay. This kind of appreciation that we're talking about today is nothing extraordinary. It's just boring, you know, uh, linear appreciation. Okay. You know, we're not saying that, Hey, you know, you're going to buy a property and, LA or San Francisco and it's or Miami, you know, some high rise crazy condo thing or something like that. And hey, you're going to time it right and get lucky. And, you know, it's going to go up 25 percent in a year. Our, our strategy is is just very conservative Buy properties that make sense the day you buy them, hold them for cash flow, let them appreciate slowly, let inflation induce debt destruction and cash on cash return make you very wealthy and keep buying the properties with the returns from the initial portfolio. And you know, that's, that strategy is a winner. We've helped thousands of clients do it over, over the last 15 years. And, um, you know, we, we can help your listeners too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I always go back to gambling because I was, before I even get as an entrepreneur, I was, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I was an entrepreneur first. But one of the things that really- Well, being an entrepreneur me, is gambling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But but it's it's it's, it's using the numbers to your advantage. Right. So but when I really started to make money as an entrepreneur, let's just put it that way, uh, before I did, I, I learned how to count cards. It's kind of a fluke, but I really oh, wow. enjoyed it. And then I took that um In, in blackjack? What's that? Or in blackjack or poker? Or what was your game? Yeah. Black yeah, but it's counting cards. Uh -huh. So I took that same probabilities mindset into the business world, mm -hmm. and that's where I made quite a bit of money. But my point is that if you had to guess, I mean, you are an expert. You've been in almost every single real estate market in the United States. If you went into, let's say, Seattle or L.A. right now, yeah. and you bought a property with, with uh, speculation, Yep. negative cash flow yep. Yep. and you bought it because you thought that it was going to double in value over the right. next 10 years. Yep. What do you think the odds of that coming to fruition would be? Just right ballpark. That's a very interesting question. And you know, um, this would be another good thing to talk about in depth on a future episode that we do. But, um, there, you know, three types of markets again, and we talked about this before, linear market, cyclical market, and hybrid market, okay? The markets you mentioned are the cyclical markets, the ones that on a chart look like a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Big ups, ugly lows, okay? We like the linear markets. They just kind of chug along. They have minor ups and downs, but generally they just have a, uh, a very modest upward trajectory over time. And um, those cyclical markets, we did a comparison on that, and we got the help of the chief economist for First American. Okay, now First American is a bunch of companies, but it's mostly a title insurance company, a big, giant title insurance company. It might be the biggest one in the country, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, uh, the First American economist... Um, uh, did this study comparing linear markets with uh, with cyclical markets. And interestingly, they used the place I spent the vast majority of my adult life, and I bought a lot of properties there, and I owned a real estate company that Coldwell Banker later bought uh, that sold a lot of these types of properties to people, mostly homeowners. But, you know, there were some gamblers and speculators and investors, and, hey, I was one of them from time to time, too. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying never speculate. Just only do it with 10% of your wealth and right. and be a little exactly. wealthy before exactly. you do it because exactly. – you only want to play that with what you can afford to lose, okay? You you can win speculating sometimes. I wouldn't deny that for a moment. Um, I, I've won speculating sometimes. Um, but uh, this comparison was uh, Orange County, California, where I, where I lived most of my adult life, versus, get this, Flint, Michigan, okay? Flint, Michigan, 
Okay. And, and over, I believe, and I don't have the chart with me, but I'm going to bring it for a future episode. We're going to look at this chart together um, it, because it's fascinating. Basically what it shows is over time. And if you're looking at, at the uh, video and not just listening, you know, the, the ups and downs in the market, Orange County, you know, it's got these glorious highs when things are going crazy, money's cheap, things are appreciating. Then it's got these really ugly downturns and, and really ugly troughs on the chart. And, and Flint, Michigan, that, you know, was mostly kind of crappy, honestly, you know, it just wasn't very impressive by any means. I mean, it's Flint, Michigan. Hey, don't drink the water. Okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this was before that. Okay. But <laughs> I, I just couldn't resist. Sorry. I apologize. It's probably not a very politically correct joke, but, uh, you know, about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, anyway, uh, over time, this is an unbelievable revelation because nobody, including myself, would have thought it would have turned out this way. Over the course of this 18-year period that they had on the charts, and, you know, admittedly, it depends what 18 years, but usually in 18 years, you're going to cover it because you'll probably have two recessions and the rest and two boom times, okay? So you're probably going to cover it okay, in, in 18 years or so. Interestingly, Flint, Michigan appreciated, and forgive me if I'm slightly off on these numbers because I'm not looking at it, but Flint, Michigan appreciated it like 5.8%. Mm. And Orange County, high flying, what they used to call Orange on the Riviera, where I live between LA and San Diego, which is this you know wealthy area, very expensive homes. I lived in Newport Coast, one of the most expensive zip codes in the entire country. Okay, uh, you know, I mean, it's super expensive, eight hundred dollars a square foot for a house. You know, plus 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 now. I'm sure well, that was twenty years ago. Uh, and um, uh, Orange County, California, five point three percent. Yeah, worse than Flint, Michigan. <laughs> Why is that? It's because it's like the example you always hear on the stock market. Look, if you own a stock and uh, it's worth $100 a share, and if that stock goes down by half and now it's only worth $50 a share, That's right. That's right. you lost 50%. But if you want to get back to 100, you have to gain 100%. That's right. That's so the right. market has to make an extraordinary move to get your money back. You know, like we talked about the last time we were together, George, it's more about return of your money than return on your money. Yeah. And and that's the thing. That's the Warren Buffett value investing idea is that, you know, on the cyclical types of stocks or real estate, you lose so much when you have that downturn that even with massive appreciation, in that example, at least, you didn't get it back. You would have been better off in the boring, unnewsworthy linear market that isn't like any trophy location by any means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, Jason. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I'm sure the viewers are going to absolutely love this content. It's it's really interesting ideas. So any if any of the viewers would like to find out more about you or any of the properties or what you do, where would they go? Uh, well, of course, they can go to jasonhartman.com, that, uh, that free video uh, that explains how to analyze a real estate investment is on the front page. Just grab that video, take a look at it. In 27 minutes, you will become very knowledgeable at how to read a performa, how to look at the metrics, how to analyze them. And then, of course, my podcast, where, where you found me, George, yeah. uh, years ago, uh, back in, I think, 2012, is called The Creating Wealth Show. It's available on any podcast platform. And, uh, and join us for the podcast. Uh, we, we have a lot of, uh, you know, big, big economic uh, celebrities, economists. We Ron did Paul. Analysis. We had Ron Paul on. We had uh, Jim <laughs> Rogers has been on three times. Steve Forbes, many others. George Gammon, uh, not the least of which is George Gammon, of course, uh, has been on the show. And uh, and and you can find me on any podcast platform. Just search my name. Look for the Creating Wealth Show. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, George. Happy investing.